Welcome to our celebration. Like all aspects of our lives in the era of COVID-19, this graduation speech is a little different. It's not live. We are not all together in person, and the visuals are recorded in my apartment here in Newark, a city that embodies the many values of our school, including inclusion, respect, and collaboration. Newark and New Brunswick may be our physical locations, but as the preeminent school of public health in New Jersey, and one of the most prominent schools in the country, our work is everywhere. Every day through our scholarship, teaching and community engagement, which is directed by social justice and health equity, we diligently, powerfully, and with zeal live our truths. Graduates, I hope you will take this time to reflect on what you have achieved in reaching this point in your lives and the significance this accomplishment holds for you and your families and your friends and your teachers and for us as a school. You should be particularly proud of having navigated the complexities of the last year as you concluded your studies and managed the treacheries of the pandemic. This moment is also an incredibly significant one for me as it marks my fourth year as Dean of our school. Many of you began your studies as I began my tenure. And over the last few years, we all have worked together with intelligence and with gusto to grow our school in prominence and in stature. More than anything else, we have also grown the relevance of our school as we collectively work to enhance the health of the people of New Jersey, the country, and the world by enacting our motto, keeping the public in public health. COVID-19 has touched all of us in all aspects of our lives. Over half a million lives have been lost in our country alone and countless others have suffered from the physical, emotional, economic, and social manifestations of this disease. We as a school, however, have led the way, developing the contact tracing program in New Jersey, which we continue to deliver, enacting research that examines both the epidemiology of the disease, but also its impact on health, appearing in the media to ensure that our fellow citizens receive the most accurate and clear information about the disease, free from any political motivation and with the health of all in our heart and much more. None of our activities during the pandemic would have been possible without your continued participation and support. We have led with empathy, recognizing that all of our actions, whether they be wearing masks, physically distancing, or being vaccinated, not only affects us, but all those with whom we interact. And we, we can come out of this pandemic. I hope we all learn not only about how we must care for each other, but also how we must be prepared as agile public health leaders, researchers, practitioners, and educators who enact the lessons of COVID-19 for the next pandemic and to address the ongoing health crises of our country. I'd like to tell you my generation's story in the hopes that your generation will heed the examples of HIV and COVID-19 to address and avoid future pandemics. I became a public health professional during the HIV AIDS epidemic at its height in the 1980s. What have we learned from HIV AIDS that applies to the current COVID-19 pandemic? This is the one question that has been posed to me time and again, likely because I have spent the last 25 years working as a researcher, educator, advocate, and activist to help control the HIV epidemic. I recently published a book, The AIDS Generation, which documents the life experiences of gay men who were infected with HIV prior to biomedical advances that developed in 1996, and that have authored both the management and prevention of the disease. Like me, these 15 men featured in the book witnessed the ravages of age and now find ourselves witnessing the current COVID-19 pandemic. Here's what I have come to know about these two viruses. HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, created terror, havoc, and death in our country and around the world in the last two decades of the 20th century. In the U.S., 700,000 people have died of age-related complications since 1981, with another 1.2 million currently infected. Within the first two decades of AIDS, infection with the virus very often led to death. The advent of effective antiviral therapies drastically reduced AIDS mortality. 
Yet despite these biomedical advances in treatment and prevention, in 2018, some 15,000 individuals died as a result of AIDS-related complications, while there were 37,000 incident cases. SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for COVID-19, has also taken a brutal toll on the United States. Since the first case was reported in the U.S. on January 20th, 2020, there have been 32 million cases with over 500,000 deaths. The, the viral pathogen is more widespread than HIV, given the ease with which it is transmitted. The virus that causes COVID-19 is also more fast acting in terms of mortality than HIV, which if detected early and if untreated would take years, not weeks to cause death as compared to COVID-19, which can kill someone within a few weeks time. However, like HIV, COVID-19 has overburdened marginalized populations, revealing systemic racism and health inequity. For example, the incidence of HIV is higher in gay and bisexual black men than any other group in our country, constituting 26% of all infections in 2018. Data recently reported in Georgia are indicative of COVID-19 disparities throughout the country, with 5.2% of those infected identifying as black, higher than any other racial group. In Indiana, SARS-CoV-2 has a heightened prevalence of 8.3% among Hispanics. These data align with patterns emerging in the COVID-19 pandemic, where higher mortality rates are being noted in black and brown populations than their white counterparts. We must also not forget that populations of color are confronted with the, out, with the realities of too often having lower economic means, being overwhelmingly represented in non-privileged essential worker roles, such as supermarket clerks and delivery people, and who are subjected to the ongoing onslaught and discrimination and hate perpetuated by social conditions and state-sanctioned laws and policies that undermine well-being, including, but not limited, to less health care access. There is much to be gleaned from our response and management of HIV with regard to the current pandemic. There is no doubt that the AIDS epidemic, like COVID-19, propelled public health into a spotlight. Many of our modern public health approaches, including the social deterministic models that direct our understanding of health and equity and disparities, were promulgated over the last four decades and are informed by the changes for which we fought during the early days of AIDS. The lessons of AIDS informed by a biopsychosocial conceptualization of health provide guidance in addressing COVID-19. Fortunately, science works. Our efforts over the last year led to the rapid development of tests, vaccines, and treatments to manage COVID-19. As a nation, with these advances at hand, we must work with the rest of the world so that other, less affluent countries may benefit from these biomedical advances, much like the PEPFAR program initiated by former President Bush to help fight AIDS in Africa. As critical to our understanding of COVID-19 as the biomedical advances are, these advances and approaches are insufficient. In the United States, the current pandemic, like, L like HIV, illustrates the myriad disparities in our society and provides a clear direction to public health leaders to continue to advance approaches that are focused on addressing inequity. While HIV and COVID-19 are caused by viruses, the health disparities evidence indicate that these diseases are directed by social and structural factors. Social and structural factors drive disease prevalence, whether it's HIV, COVID-19, or chronic diseases such as obesity and hypertension. In effect, the lesson from AIDS is that we must tackle social conditions if we are to contain the disease. Consider, for example, that in the current pandemic, we ask families in multiple generational homes with limited space and those with housing instability to physically isolate. How is this possible? With regard to place, those environments in which discrimination runs rampant, where healthcare access is limited and where politics undermine science, SARS-CoV-2, like HIV, is unbridled in its transmission patterns, creating disease hotspots. The spread of both HIV and SARS-CoV-2 throughout the southern United States demonstrates the notion that social context matters. And AIDS has also taught us that altruism is a powerful tool. 
The late activist Larry Kramer warned gay men about caring for each other and not spraying each other in the early days of AIDS, as exemplified in his 2005 speech at Cooper Union. The use of condoms was one of, the, was one of the few tools in our arsenal to maintain the virus prior to the development of biomedical prevention efforts. Coupled with testing, altruism is a critical element in preventing the spread of HIV. Altruism is certainly a tool that can be used to fight COVID-19. Face masks and vaccines are the condoms of the current pandemic. Like condoms, however, which were inconsistently used across the population, Face masks, one of the few tools we have, we have to prevent the spread of SARS-CoV-2, are being rejected by segments of the U.S. population and thus increasing vulnerability for those most at risk for COVID-19 mortality. Others cast vaccines aside in fear of the damage they may do, but mostly because of false notions that aren't supported by science or by a notion that COVID-19 is somehow a hoax. During the current pandemic, we must continue to motivate individuals to actively protect their social circles as well as essential workers and the general public with whom they interact. The idea of altruism, which has proved so powerful in HIV, must also play a significant role in containing COVID-19 as we recognize that we are all in this together. The knowledge and tools we have developed in our four decade war on HIV provide guidance on how we can control and ultimately defeat SARS-CoV-2 to bring an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. Significantly, the lessons of AIDS point to the imperative that we tackle the virus using a multi-pronged approach informed by a bio-psycho-social perspective of health. As such, we must create tools to control the virus biologically, but also tools to work with human beings who got, whose cognitions must be shaped and whose fears must be managed to curtail the further spread of this disease. The battle is not over and we all know it. You, as our new public health leaders, will play a critical role as we continue to fight COVID-19 and other health disparities. We know they exist. We must eradicate them. In the end, a vaccine will help us control the virus biologically, but the pandemic has shown us that public health matters. It has always mattered and will always matter. The tools, skills, and knowledge you have developed at the Rutgers School of Public Health will be essential to enhancing the health of the people in our state, in our country, and in our world. And these abilities should always be coupled with the two core principles that define our school, social justice and health equity, critical to enhancing the health of populations. Where does this leave you? I hope it leaves you here with the idea that your career as a public health researcher or practitioner ultimately will be more powerful if you also function as an advocate and an activist, or work closely with advocates and activists who bring science to life. It leaves you with the idea that public health is not a discipline to be practiced behind a computer. It leaves you with the idea that public health is a robust science that is conducted with the populations we study, recognizing that we as scientists have as much to learn from those whom we study as they do from us. And I hope it leaves you with the idea that laws can create enormous damage to our health whether we're denying a woman the right to have control of her own body or caging young babies ripped from the arms of their mothers or telling trans soldiers they do not have the right to serve in our armed forces or denying states the resources they need to fight COVID-19. So in closing, let me state these affirmations. We are proud of you, our graduates, as you make your ways into the world, into the field of public health and beyond. And we look to you to lead the way, challenge the norms, fight for the rights of the people and improve the health of our population here in New Jersey, throughout our country and the world. I in turn promise you that we, the faculty and staff, will continue to build a school of public health of which you'll be proud to be an alum. So dear graduates, go out and make those dreams for a better and healthier world come true. So fight COVID-19, fight inequities, fight injustice, fight corrupt law politics and laws, Fight with the notion that a biopsychosocial model is the only way to deliver prevention and care. Fight with the tools we have helped you develop here at the school and also fight, fight with your heart. And in doing so, your work will be enhanced, honest, and true. This is a moment of social justice. This is a moment of activism. As I conclude, let me simply say, well done graduates and congratulations to all of you. 
and congratulations to all of those who in your life have supported you throughout the journey. Most of all, I wish all of us good health. Thank you, Dean Halkidis, members of the faculty, students, family, friends, and distinguished guests. I'm happy to greet you on this momentous occasion and offer congratulations to all of you on behalf of the Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences community. Less than a year and a half ago, the world woke up to the reality of the first global pandemic of our lifetimes. The first confirmed case of the novel coronavirus was detected in New Jersey in March of 2020. And in the days since, more than 23,000 residents of New Jersey and millions more worldwide lost their lives to this disease. Many of us didn't understand then the drastic ways our daily lives would change, the personal and societal toll this pandemic would cause, and the resilience we would all need to summon to overcome it. From the beginning, even more than many other institutions, Rutgers University was on the front lines. We responded to this global emergency in ways big and small, by creating a better COVID-19 testing method and sharing this discovery with the world. We worked with our hospital and health system partners to care for the sick at risk to our own providers, and then conducted research into how the disease impacted our healthcare workers. Your school partnered with our state government to launch a contact tracing initiative to track and mitigate the spread of this disease. We worked to successfully keep the campus an island of relative health in a sea of disease. We graduated your friends and peers from the medical, pharmacy, and nursing classes of 2020 early so they could shore up our weary healthcare providers during the height of our collective uncertainty and need. And we conducted vaccine clinical trials to speed the approval of our best hope for bringing us back together as soon as possible. It is too soon to tell what the lasting legacies of the past year will be but I'm hopeful that society's renewed appreciation for public health, science, and the health professions will usher in a renaissance of forward-looking policies, life-changing discoveries, innovative and integrated treatments, and a commitment to ensuring that all of our community members receive the care that they need. The country is clearly investing in public health now in a way it has not done so in years. Hopefully, Memories will endure, and so will those investments. Though unfortunately, we will continue to battle this virus for many months and years to come, the unprecedented scientific rigor, ingenuity, and collaboration that we have seen and contributed to this past year promise a new horizon for patient care that is vivid with potential. So today, as we celebrate you and recognize the years of hard work and preparation that have brought you here, I'm confident that we can count on each of you to continue this work to advance research, policy, and interventions for a healthier and better prepared future. Now, more than ever, the field of public health demands all the skill, tenacity, and innovative thinking that you can muster. We will apply the theory and practice of public health for the benefit of individuals, families, communities, and societies as a whole and we will deploy our skills to inform public policy, increase the health of the population, and preserve the human dignity of everyone. What you do will impact lives in the most direct and meaningful ways, and that is the greatest joy and privilege. You have answered a noble call to serve others, and we will all be the better for your dedication and selflessness. This is a day of great personal achievement for each of you, and a culmination of your educational careers. I'm so proud to be a part of your day, to enjoy your success, and to share in it with your family and your friends. So on behalf of all the administration, faculty, and staff of Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences, congratulations and thank you. Mary Adadeji. Tobchi Alamezoho Miriam Ali
Naomi Benderly Creeman. Salami BNA. Brianna Bowles. Nicole Burrows. Emil Lysinovert. Julie Cortez Cavaschini. Nicholas Delisi. Jasper DeShields. Bernadette DeMano. Alexander Goroksuk. Mackenzie Henderson. Niall Khan. Anthony Neff. Pansy Law. Carrie Laprit. Kwamira Lumpkins. Gabriella Medina. Rushna Mosin. Samantha Posada. Jennifer Rader. Diane Rajamani. Sarah Rasool. Nalixa Ravel. Joanne Say. Juliana Winkoop. Greetings, faculty, staff, my fellow graduates, and families watching from laptop and computer screens, both here and abroad. I want to begin by saying thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. A few weeks ago, when I received the email that I am the 2021 Stanley S. Bergen Jr. MD Medal of Excellence recipient, I really expected a follow-up email letting me know that there had been an error, that this award was going to someone else someone more deserving. In my mind, I am not Beyonce. I am Michelle or Kelly on a really good day. Part of me still feels that way, but if it really was a mistake, it's too late to change your minds anyway. I began to think, however, why was my instant reaction one of doubt? Why was I surprised that my hard work would be recognized? I have a suspicion as to why. During this pandemic, there's been a consistent theme, recognition. Many have recognized social injustices, racism, healthcare inequality, health disparities, and so much more. While we recognize these massive problems, it can seem as though recognizing accomplishments is inappropriate, or in some cases, impossible. Even when we're having big life events, they can still feel so little compared to everything happening all around us, or the mundaneness of each passing day sucks the last ounce of motivation you have. I don't know about you, but I would be content if we never got onto another Zoom call. But today, we ought to be recognized for our hard work and our dedication to public health education. We should not belittle this important achievement. What we have accomplished here today, this is worth celebrating, even if we're alone while we do it. This feeling of not being recognized is so common in public health, isn't it? There's a reason so many of us find public health later in life. Because we never hear about it until there's a crisis. In all seriousness, when I told my friends that I would be studying epide epidemiology, one of them told me that she was so excited. 
because now I could give her skincare advice. She had confused epidemiology with the epidermis of the skin. Now, amid a major pandemic, knowledge of public health has become far more widespread. But if you think about it, if we do our jobs well, public health professionals won't get great recognition. When our communities are healthy, when our air is clean, when our water is safe, it's taken for granted. So we don't get noticed. Oftentimes, public health gets the spotlight when there's a crisis, such as the one we're in right now. To an extent, I can understand it. Public health isn't sexy at all. As a contact tracer, I can tell you right now that nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody wants to discuss their COVID-19 diagnosis or hear that they were in contact with someone who was sick. No one wants to be told to quarantine for 14 days to stay six feet away from loved ones, to shut down a business. And yet here we are at the face of such restrictions. Even before COVID, public health measures are oftentimes underfunded because we are working to prevent health problems. Our impact as public health professionals has been and always will be important, even when we aren't recognized. After this past year, the significance of public health could not be clearer. What we study and the work that we do genuinely improves the lives around us, even when we don't have the spotlight. Our families, our neighborhoods, our world needs us. COVID-19 will not be our last battle. There is still so much work to do, from cancer to environmental health to maternal child health. Black mothers are still seven times more likely than white mothers to die from maternity-related complications. And a black baby is over three times more likely than a white baby to die before his or her first birthday. Those are just statistics for New Jersey, but there are still 49 other states and the rest of the world. There's work to be done, and our education has equipped us with the tools we need to help address these types of issues. The endless nights of trying to understand SAS, run a regression analysis, and remember when to use a cohort versus a case control study was all worth it. Because the degrees we are receiving today will change lives. If that isn't worth celebrating, I don't know what is. If the pandemic ended tomorrow, I wonder if the world would still view public health the same. I wonder if we would learn to prioritize prevention and invest in public health. I wonder if public health professionals would receive the recognition we deserve. If we can improve the lives and health of our community, but are still singing the backup for the backup for the Beyonce's of healthcare, that's still okay. We may be Michelle to the world, but here, today, we are Beyonce. Thank you all so much. Congratulations to the class of 2021. Fatima Abdul Rahman. Jeffrey Addy. Blair Adkins. Juhi Agarwal Sarah Alavi Hira Ali Patricia Amarilla Joshua Antonis I feel you what Eridegbi. Muhammad Atiya. Jessica Ayers. Lashida Barnes. Et Van Bartholus.
Michael Bosley. Lindy Berg. Alison Bilofsky. Kezia Bobin. Lauren Brown. Laura Bruce. Renee Cavetta. Laura Cerruti. Hao Ching Chin. Maria Christodoulou. Karis Chikuka. Yen Koba Mayan Kola Tat Tammy Kola Tat Diamond Cunningham Deanna Daly Abigail David Lisa Dawson Annan Caitlin Decker Tatiana Desire Brissard Till my Tatia alone. Sierra Downey. Lydia Dunn. Jessica Dizik. Susanna Echeverry Herrera. Jenilee Ishak Nena Azaigui Edward Two Eisenwaffer Amarachi Zuma Binta Fofana Alexandra Fox Andrea Galfo Zoe Garcia Zuri Gill Devin Gillen Nishi Gonzalez Chelsea Gray Ayushi Galati Manisha Gurumurthy Brianna Hansen Farhana Hawk Fathi Manir Hassan Tiffany Hernandez
India Jackson. Lomini Jackson. Nicole Jones. Jill Lean Jewels. Elizabeth Kaplan. Sadia Khan. Alexandria Kulik. Grace Quo. Yatand Lana. Yuashi Leong. Trevor Martindale. Sanjana Mutta. Merlene Maxi. Daria McClam. Samantha Metlitz. Jennifer Miller. Tati Mingo. Christopher Minnick. Natalie Montez. Haima Moparthi. Bulongo Tracy Mazandu. Navig Na Nathi. Chimazin Dukaba. Juliana Nienart. Kelsey Novo. Nina Olson. Ya Opokumensa. Deborah or Beer. Samantha Orifis. Elise Osher. Dakota Pastor. Himanabin Patel. Kripa Patel. Priyanka Patel. Shilpa Patel Tulsidas. Gregory Peck. Marina Piretti. Archana Ragunat. Diego Ramirez. Eleanor Ratner. Amber Roxon.
Brittany Rule. Rag of such Deva. Sarah Sahali. Jenna Saluchi. Mikesha Samuel. Hannah Sawicki. Mariah Scott. Versha Shah. Pirtha Jagdish Shetty. Kyle Simmons. Norseum. Alexandra Sobel. Sanjana Subramanya. Bethlehem Tesfay. Tharani Thiva Kumar. Radhika Trivedi. Renel Tulloch. Sesha Madhuri Vemavarapu. Annette von Jaglinski. Juliana Wisniewski. Beth Ann Wittig. Nicole Yaron. Victoria Yuen. Aaron Zagorski. Kulsum Zara. Ichin Zhou. Alexandra Zivkovic. Good afternoon, graduates, family, friends, and honored guests. I'm honored to speak to you as the 2021 Distinguished Alumni Speaker today. Graduates, you have worked hard and sacrificed many things to achieve your degree. And congratulations not only to you, but to all those along the way who helped you. This is a very special year because the, where the importance of public health has finally reached the recognition it deserves. My name is Roseanne Marone, and I graduated in 1993. I was nominated by a very dear colleague, Heidi Haken, who I met in my statistics class next door at the medical school. And we have been friends and worked in the field of HIV since then. So what a year this has been, these unprecedented times for the 21st century. I thought quite a bit to see if I could find the right theme for the class of 2021 and decided to keep it simple. Since we are so fatigued, by all the monumental changes that prevail every second of every day. And despite this storm, we have seen such dedication and so many people taking the lead to care for others, whether it's the physicians, the researchers, the doctors, nurses, truly has made 
a difference. So there are many people that I'd like to thank who helped me reach my goals. First and foremost, the School of Public Health esteemed faculty, Dr. Robert Like and Dr. Mary Breckenridge, who I met when I moved to New Jersey. I was welcomed into the program with their caring and kindness. I chose the Family Health Track since it had, line, since it had aligned with my earlier work. Dr. Like was my faculty advisor throughout the program, and there's no other person like him who has the intelligence and wisdom to mentor, teach, and motivate. I was most drawn to Dr. Like's philosophy that humanity is a mosaic, that each unique aspect of every person needs to be valued and cherished. Also, Dr. Like had laid the foundations for the basics of cultural competency, which has become a standard, a best practice, and that started in the early 90s. His message rang in my heart because of my early career days were spent in New York. Dr. Like even used the word syndemic, not just an epidemic or even a pandemic. And to think that your journey is in the midst of a pandemic, which, has also, which is also surrounded by the many syndemics. The COVID pandemic has unearthed many, many buried problems. Also, I would like to thank George Rhodes, who was Dean at the time, who launched the school to a higher level, and also Dean Halkidis, whose boundless energy forges, is forging the school ahead in uncharted territory. The core of my journey has been service to others, working with the underdog. And public health gives us the wide lens view to the world. It covers the air, the sea, space, and beyond. Growing up, I was fortunate to live in a time when I witnessed my neighbor care for drug-addicted babies as a foster parent. I was in awe to see how the swaddling that she did soothed their tiny bodies and, of course, their minds. And, to, and, and also, not only did I see the 1960s unfold on TV, but I went to my older sister's New York City public school classroom in the South Bronx. And I went with another sister to her Manhattan office to see the business center in life. Many things shaped my interest, and they're too long to list. But I saw the war on poverty, the Civil Rights Act, the Vietnam War, the Equal Rights Act, hostages and hijacking, and HIV and AIDS. Growing up in the city, I was afforded multiple opportunities that put my finger on the pulse of humanity. Where do you live? Where's the hospital, the pharmacy? How do you get there? Transportation, what's your transportation, your school? Where do you go to school? Where, where's your spiritual home? How does your day start? What happens in the middle? How does your day end? Each step of the way, the world I knew grew larger, more diverse, not only economically, spiritually, and definitely medically. Hearing and seeing and learning things on the ground could never be taken for granted. Life was complex. People's lives were challenged by racism, poverty, illiteracy, and trauma upon trauma. And yet, each person was resilient and marched forward with their hopes and dreams. They had such might in their fight. I had always felt and believed that we should always put ourselves in another person's shoes. I started nursing school, which was very interesting, and we had many different rotations, and one stands out. And it was, at, it was psychiatric nursing, and the instructor said, there's nothing worse than psychiatric pain. 
People suffering from psychiatric issues have little respite or relief. Just think now of the devastation of mental health issues. I completed my nursing degree and worked as a public health nurse for a small nonprofit agency in the South Bronx. I learned from experienced supervisors from the beginning how to talk to the patients, understand their daily lives. It's not just the, pa it's not just the patient who is our patient, it was the neighborhood and community. Learning to assess what was available to them, the physical environment, where do they live, how many flights of stairs. It was truly family health services. We worked with, with patients with limited means which surely lent itself for them to be very creative and most importantly, resourceful. I learned many things, but two things I'd like to share today. One is that when I asked a patient if she had any chest pain since the last time I saw her, she said, oh yes, the other day when I had a run because I heard gunshots. The other key lesson was from another patient who told me that we were once a man, twice a child, meaning that we need to care for everyone throughout their lifespan. Every part of their life cycle, we must be able to support them through those changes. After the, after the experience in the South Bronx, I went to work in a traditional med surge nursing floor, and again, seeing the crossroads of the world. Then I went to work in a special care nursery, which was the only type of unit between Albany and the, and the, and the Bronx. And after a few years of working with special needs infants with birth to three, I moved to New Jersey seeking an adventure. <clears throat> after two years in New Jersey of, of working with their early intervention, I decided to work with the Central New Jersey Pediatric AIDS Program. It was a program for children and families with HIV, which started in 1988, and I joined in 1990. We witnessed how this devastating disease ravaged babies, younger children, and their family. There was no medicine to treat HIV in children in 1990. It wasn't until 19, 1989 that the first medication was identified, which is known as AZT, but it was only in a pill form. The kids had to wait several years before it was made into a liquid or an IV formula. And this work was not done alone. We were a team of physicians, social workers, psychologists, and case managers. And I want to acknowledge the, the two physicians who I continue to work with, Dr. Sunan Degar and Dr. Patricia Whitley Williams, whose names I'm sure you know, who not only have done so much in the field of HIV, but their compassion and dedication have led them to be at the, at the head of the COVID pandemic. Not at the head. That, Dr. Sunandagar and Dr. Willie Williams, who, re, who remain dedicated in compassion by continuing their care during, this, during the COVID pandemic. Our doctors are the best. They provide care and treatment with utmost compassion. They do research, they teach, and most importantly, they advocate. They really say what the, what the patients need. In order, in order to help them not only in that acute moment, but throughout their childhood. Our team was not able to offer hope. Mothers and children died without having the chance. And despite this darkness, we, we were part of the Pediatric AIDS Clinical Trial Group, where the first combination of medications were studied. And this was before the, um, what we call the protease inhibitors and, and the advancement of, of medications. HIV was a disease that was wrought with stigma and shame. Yet our patients were just regular people whose lives were turned upside down. 
and they were wrung out like, and their lives were turned upside down. Bridge, we care for over 75% minorities, if not more, throughout the years. We were able to forge ahead because of the passing of the Ryan White Care Act in 1990. He was the young boy who had hemophilia and the federal government passed legislation to provide comprehensive, coordinated care for our patients. Also saying that the patient had to be part of the healthcare team. We, we, were, we were fortunate to go to Washington DC with our patients, with, our, with the parents and help educate our state senators and congressmen. The patients share their stories, their day to day, and their passion also helped, we, helped make some changes in policy. The parents, and they were not only parents, they could have been aunts, uncles, grandparents, foster parents. They were, their dedication was like nothing I had ever seen before as far as human caring. In the, mid, in the mid to late 90s, we saw the development of many new drugs and combinations of medications, which helped reduce the progression of the virus. But more importantly, we saw the reduction of mother to, mother to child transmission, again, with the use of medication. So HIV then became a chronic illness and our patients were able to thrive and survive. Through the, last, through the last two and a half decades, we made many strides. So much that I, of what I learned in the School of Public Health. It made a, a smooth, <laughs> it made a smooth transition for me working in the COVID pandemic with our HIV patients. I felt very prepared and I still hear the things that Dr. Like and Dr. Breckenridge had shared. Working as part of a team is the most important aspect of anything anyone can do in this, in this time. It has worked in HIV, and we see that it's working with COVID. So in closing, I feel as I feel you are, the graduates, are equipped to face any challenge, which today I believe are magnified beyond words. And your education at the School of Public Health is exceptional. And each day you need to wake up with hope to face any challenge that comes your way. I have a favorite singer from the 60s, Carol King, who said, you have to wake up every morning with a smile on your face and show the world all the love in your heart. Now more than ever, this is so very true. Never ever give up and think things are impossible. Stay strong and keep the might in your fight. Congratulations to you and to everyone who helped you achieve your degree. Good luck and I wish you the best. Ilza Burson. Brielle Formanowski Catherine Gamble Danden Guan Peter Habib Hu Wei Crystal Huey Xiao Ching Lin Priyanka Narvakar Radha Madhavi Riali Alexander Scherer 
so harm should left. Chuck Wokadibia, you D. Do you and Wong? Meijin Yao. Weining Zhang. Bi Yunzo. President Holloway, Chancellor Brian Strom, Dean Perry Halkidis, Dr. Lori Garrett, distinguished alums, faculty, staff, friends, and graduates. It is a tremendous honor to be speaking to you here today. Graduates of the class of 2021, congratulations. This has been a challenging year for everyone. During this time, we have experienced two pandemics that have deeply impacted our lives the COVID-19 global pandemic, and the pervasive racial inequities and injustices in our country. Let's take a moment to pause, breathe, reflect, and reimagine a new future where public health is a human right and diversity, equity, and inclusion are the core values of our institutions. We all have lived through a very challenging year and everyone's context and experience and how this past year has been are shaped by social determinants of health, lived experience, and whether you come from a marginalized community. We honor your friends, family, community, and the institutional anchors who have stood with you, shielding you from the sorrow and the pain of these pandemics. Thank you for helping our graduates find the safety and security they needed during this painful time. And if you were the shield, thank you for being brave and having the courage to be the protector of the people around you. As you prepare a new roadmap for the future, take some time to reassess the current situation, your strengths and accomplishments, and strategically prepare for next steps. I learned this through my own journey as a first generation college graduate. Because of limited social capital and resources, I've had to pivot a lot through the years. I was, it was not easy. I made many mistakes. I did not have a parachute to help me out of my troubles, but through every challenge, every heartbreak, homelessness, and every death, I learned to develop an internal moral compass. My GPS guided me through complex challenges and situations. I learned to be quiet, to stand still, listen to my surroundings, and sharpen my inherited worth, knowing that I can address any weakness in time and live up to my potential. I found a community of like-minded spirits, friends, and helpers that supported me 100% and who honestly had my back. These opportunities exist because I genuinely believe that people are inherently good. I learned to normalize the ebbs and flows of change and make sure that I to make sure to take care of myself. I learned how to take care of myself when I bought my first car, the blue, the blue Chevy, when I moved to South Carolina for my doctoral education. Even though I grew up in Los Angeles, I never owned a car and rarely drove so this was a new world to me. I learned I had to clean the inside of it, otherwise old food would stink the interior and maggots would ruin the carpet. Other car owners reminded me to change the oil every 3,000 3, to 5,000 miles, check the tires and pressure, change the brakes every so often, always, change the, always check the mirrors. And when I was low on gas or close to empty, I had to find the nearest gas station because the car would not run if it were on empty. And sadly, I had many situations where my car stopped running because I could not find or locate the closest gas station and strangers helped me out out of these sticky situations. 
Leo Biscaglia, known for his writings on love, said, too often we underestimate the power of touch, a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, and an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn a life around. As you move forward in your next journey, find ways to sharpen your inner spark and keep your moral compass alive. Finally, make plans to live up to your true potential and inherited worth. President Obama once said, and I quote, you can't give up your passion if, if things don't work right the right way. You can't lose your heart or grow cynical if there are twists and turns on your journey. The cynics may be the loudest voices, but I promise you, they will accomplish the least. It's those folks who stay at it those who do the long, hard, committed work of change that gradually push this country in the right direction and make the most lasting difference. And I believe that strategy is always to know you matter, that you are valued, and most importantly, that you are loved. Because no matter what life brings, look at it as an opportunity to pivot, keep going, or stand still. In conclusion, this past year has been chaotic, divisive, and filled with uncertainty. Take this opportunity to fill it with hope, joy, grit, courage, and love, because every day is a choice. Whatever you do in life, let's do it together, holding hands and reimagine our future as public health leaders, advocates, change agents, visionaries, and friends because silence is no longer an option. On behalf of our, of our beloved School of Public Health, I leave you with these words and I, that I tell my daughter, everything is fine, there is nothing wrong, and you are beautiful and perfect the way you are. Congratulations, class of 2021. We are very, very proud of you. Sarah Elnakib. Nanji. Maeve Lopriato. Suyin No. Wei Wong. Jessica Weaver Kaya Misha Renee Evans Thank you, Dean Halkidis. And thank you to all of the faculty and students of the School of Public Health and the families and friends of the school's new graduates, many of you who sacrificed in order to support the student who is now receiving their degree for honoring me with your attention. If this weren't a virtual gathering, if we were all gathered on the lawn in Piscataway on this spring day, those of you about to receive your MPH or your PhD would be itching to go party thinking about the cold champagne or the beers that await you. But this is the age of COVID-19 and we're virtually gathered. So nevertheless, I have to say, my God, how lucky you are. I know you might not be feeling lucky after months of studying in isolation, trying to finish research without actually touching anybody or being with them in their homes, workplaces, schools, or environments. I imagine, frankly, that some of you are feeling kind of sorry for yourselves, regardless of which of the school's 11 concentrations you're in, maybe you think you've missed out somehow, but nothing could be further from the truth because you have completed your studies amidst the largest public health catastrophe since the 1981 arrival of HIV AIDS or since the 1918 great influenza, you are in the cat seat. Things your 2019 graduating predecessors could only imagine in the abstract have been concrete realities for you. 
that statistics class you took, heck, every public health student took some permutation of that course for decades. But you can see people applying those data methods in real time every day online, trying to puzzle out who is at most risk for SARS-CoV-2 infection? What is the case fatality rate of COVID-19? What are the odds that a given patient with a given set of socioeconomic and health parameters will survive intubation? And that Epi 101 class, huh, now you see COVID co cohorts being created in real time. Witness the misapplications of antigen tests versus nucleic acid diagnostics. Monitor efforts to dissect the racial and class differences in infection and transmission rates. Contact tracing, nothing abstract for you. You've seen it and maybe even participated in it with COVID. 20 years ago, I was named a special lecturer for the Columbia University School of Journalism, focusing on science reporting. I had one session with my students, and a couple of days later, Mohammed Atta flew a hijacked passenger jet into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. I saw with my own eyes from my near nearby rooftop, the second jet slice across the top floors of the North Tower, and I raced towards the inflamed buildings to cover the story. When my Columbia University class reconvened a couple of days later, I told the students, go downtown, bear witness. This may be the biggest story of your life. Today, you, the future public health practitioners, can bear witness to what may well be the biggest event in your field in your lifetime. And what have we seen? A bat virus of the Coronaviridae family appeared in people in the enormous city of Wuhan, located in the center of China, populated by some 13 million people and the central hub of the nation's high-speed train network. It was December, just before what we in the West call Christmas. Nobody knows how the rare bat virus ended up in people, what intermediary animal species may have been infected. Who was the first human case? Nobody knows. And there we have lesson one for public health. In the absence of absolute certainty regarding the origins of disease, conspiracies, accusations, disinformation, and poor suppositional science surge forward. Does it matter where it came from? Of course it does. I was in China and Hong Kong throughout the 2003 SARS epidemic, which was also caused by a bat virus, a close cousin of SARS-CoV-2. The virus spread from smuggled bats captured by hunters in Southeast Asia to captive co-housed civets, a mongoose-like mammal that is eaten as a Cantonese delicacy in Southern China. And then it spread to restaurant workers in Guangzhou who slaughtered and skinned the animals for service to restaurant customers. And then spread like a brush fire through hospitals all over China, Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand, eventually 31 countries. And spread over and over again within Toronto, three outbreaks in one of the most advanced medical communities in the world. By eliminating the trade in civets and vastly improving hospital infection control standards, the SARS epidemic stopped nine months after it began, having sickened more than 8,000 people, killing 774 or nearly 10% of those it infected. Another cousin of our catastrophic COVID-19 is MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, also a bat virus. It continues to spread primarily in Saudi Arabia. Since its discovery in 2012, MERS has sickened 2,574 people, killing 885 of them. That's a case fatality rate three times worse than SARS, 34%. How did it get from Egyptian tomb bats to people? Through camels. By taking steps to limit certain types of human camel interactions in, in Arabia, and cleaning up hospitals. The spread of MERS has dropped from hundreds of cases worldwide seven years ago to just four in Saudi Arabia alone in 2020. So it matters where COVID came from. But here's the lesson. 
the World Health Organization and thousands of scientists the world over can't solve the COVID mystery because it's been politicized by charges and countercharges hurled between the United States and China for more than a year. It's poisoned. It's toxic. The, public, the public's health remains endangered as a result. It's source unknown. The virus can reemerge at any time today or 10 years from now. Lesson two, never trust the official data. Find back channels, be skeptical, dig for the truth. Authorities in Wuhan last January covered up the outbreak entirely when brave physician Li Wenliang and a handful of colleagues posted news of a SARS-like pneumonia filling hospitals in the city, they were reprimanded severely. When officials finally, on December 30th, 2019, acknowledged the pneumonia outbreak, they insisted it all stemmed from one live animal market, which they closed, therefore declared the epidemic was over, nothing to worry about, don't look behind these curtains, story is over. For three weeks thereafter, all the data, the cases, the hospitalizations, the deaths were fabricated, misleading the WHO and the entire world. Nothing resembling the truth was released from Beijing until January 20th, 2020, by which time the annual mass migration, the world's largest domestic migration every year for the Lunar New Year was underway. Wuhan was heading into a lockdown and the virus had already spread to many countries worldwide, including the United States. Most of the countries were unaware. So never believe the initial data. Whether it is deliberate obfuscation or the fog of war in a crisis, the early outbreak data is usually wrong and often sadly deliberately so. Lesson three, whether you like it or not, Public health is politics. Most practitioners of public health are government or NGO, non-governmental organization employees. Most budgets for public health are controlled by politicians. And no public health policy gets far without political support from the very top. Within days of discovery of cases in Kirkland, Washington, the tone in the other Washington, Washington, DC, shifted from Xi Jinping has it under control to I, Donald Trump, have it under control to this is just a bad flu. It'll go away in no time. As Heinrich Ebsen taught us in his 1882 masterpiece, An Enemy of the People, nobody thanks the messenger who tells them that there must be economic consequences in order to save lives. Dr. Thomas Stockman, was, was the chief medical officer in An Enemy of the People for a Norwegian town that is undergoing an economic boom after opening a fancy spa. Stockman discovers deadly bacteria growing in the waters that feed the spa and insists that for the safety of all, the spa must be closed. When he reads his report in a public meeting, the audience rebels, repeatedly shouting, he is an enemy of the people. He is an enemy of the people. How is that different from cries that COVID masks are tyranny and Tony Fauci is the enemy? Or Santa Cruz, California health officer, Dr. Gail Newell being greeted with a crowd on her front lawn chanting, Gail to jail, Gail to jail or Tucker Carlson shouting on Fox News, take off your mask, or Dr. Dr. Marcus Lacerda, declaration of a public health emergency in Manaus, Brazil, that ended up resulting in so many death threats that he's been forced to hire private security guards, or calls to kill Paris doctor Nathan Pfeiffer Samaya because he insisted hydroxychloroquine could not cure COVID or Pastor Rick Wiles of Vero Beach, Florida, saying from his pulpit that Dr. Anthony Fauci should be waterboarded and tortured, quote, for spreading false information. A recent survey of 900 American public health and physician leaders by Physicians for Human Rights found 40% are fearful of speaking out publicly on controversial issues surrounding COVID, including mask wearing, and vaccination. 
Worldwide, PHR says, there are 360 incidents of attacks on health advocates related to COVID just between January and August of 2020. In Putin's Russia, government health workers have been ordered to fabricate COVID numbers, dropping by some estimates 400,000 cases of infection from the country's official tally. You can't trust anyone, one epidemiologist told reporters. That first group of doctors that issued warnings in Wuhan, all have either died of COVID, been silenced, or disappeared. Under President Trump, the Centers for Disease Control scientists were effectively gagged. Their findings, which could have guided public health responses far better in the pandemic, were suppressed. In March of this year, President Biden's CDC director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, issued a detailed list of false claims issued by the Trump CDC and studies that were covered up, inconvenient truths. Lesson four, public health does a lousy job of recognizing trends in a crisis that derive from racism or poverty. I know that one of the slogans of this School of Public Health is racism is a public health crisis, but few public health institutions teach or use the tools necessary to dissect in real time how structural racism versus entrenched poverty versus individual clinical risk, much less collectively or individually contribute to risk. How do you dissect the contributions of each of those pieces of the puzzle. Public health threat assessment all too often falls back on well-established liberal themes, too rarely dives for real data and gropes for real analysis. Even now, after mountains of evidence shows that African-Americans, Native Americans, and Latinx are at far higher risk for acquiring COVID-19 infection and dying from the disease, uh, and I would argue, basically, the issues are unresolved. Are they at greater risk because they are also far more likely to have underlying hypertension and diabetes? Are they at greater risk because they have frontline jobs that push them into virus exposure on a daily basis when most of us were hunkered down in self-imposed quarantine? So they were more apt simply to get infected? Are they living in denser housing? Do they have larger families? Are they more likely to be exposed to risk within their households? These have never been properly teased out. And a lot of statements and assertions have been made without the kind of hard evidence that I hope as you go forward as public health practitioners, you will insist upon not only from yourself, but from your coworkers, your fellow public health practitioners. Time doesn't allow me, and I know you want to go off and share that champagne with your family. So time doesn't allow me to go through every single lesson of COVID-19. I'm sure you have a list in your head, and you know that there is a long list of mistakes made by all parties, the political leaders, the public health leaders, the medical leaders. I will note one that sticks in my craw. It's here in New York City. We had the greatest public health department, arguably in the entire world. So many major breakthroughs in the history of public health, dating all the way back to the earliest days of germ theory, came out of the New York City Health Department. In this epidemic, it has been stripped of its authority, its public health trained leadership removed from office by the mayor, and instead, the whole public health department given over whole hog to organize medicine and the control of the hospitals corporation. This illustrates one last lesson. There's a reason public health operates out of the ugly government buildings. There's a reason your school of public health isn't made out of marble and festooned with grand decor. There's a reason that the pay base salaries in public health are comparatively low. It's because the power struggle between organized medicine and public health has always ended up on the side of organized medicine. And you have to remember, you protect entire populations. Organized medicine protects individuals. Both are important, but in my mind, the balance weighs on the side of population protection. 
So treasure your knowledge, treasure this unique experience you've had this year in the age of COVID and go forward bravely. Thank you and congratulations.